All right. Here's what happened. I visited Texas, came back, got a job at Target, went to some doctors. All of you who theorized I might have ADHD, turns out you were right. Got on Vivans, I realized taking over the world isn't so hard after all. Notice Target barely pays me more than YouTube and it's objectively worse in every possible way. So I quit that shit, now I'm gonna do whatever I want a few times a month while I'm busy behind the scenes with other stuff. And I know what you're thinking, and no, I'm not working on some multi-part anniversary special just because it's been 10 years since the first Door Monster video came out with a whole big story arc wrapping up all the loose threads and Kyleverse stuff and a bunch of references to past videos and a musical number. That would be way too much work, and I sleep now, ever since our Patreon hit $4,000. Oh, it didn't? That must be why I'm so tired. Today, I wanted to do a big conceited rant on my writing opinions, and that's gone surprisingly well in the past, so buckle up, here we go! Allison and I have been re-watching old 2000s movies whenever the vague memory of one pops into our heads. Not always good ones, just memorable ones, like High School Musical or Uptown Girls, or Penelope, that one about the girl with the pig nose, you know, the classics. And every time I watch one, I can't help but think, this has something that new stuff is missing and it sure as hell isn't production quality. And then I try to correct myself because I don't want to be getting old enough to think everything from my childhood was better than things are now. And then I try to reconcile those two things because I do think there are valid reasons that media has been on a decline, but also I'm certainly more cynical than I used to be. But also I think I've always been pretty judgmental deep down inside and I just have been repressing it and I kind of don't want to do that anymore, but then I have another internal battle with my own self-hatred. And then I'm tired and I need to take a nap, but I can't because we still haven't reached $4,000 on patreon.com slash doormonster, which also has weekly podcasts and custom merchandise. I think we've all noticed film becoming more industry and less art for years now. As video content becomes a factory-made product, the industry around it attracts entrepreneurs more than artists, and they love being filmmakers much more than they love filmmaking. The result I'm seeing is that movies and television shows have become more and more about themselves in a weird meta way, and less and less about creating a self-contained experience. The priority has become showing off, winking at the camera, breaking the fourth wall, things that used to be cute and fun in moderation, but have now become the standard. What? What kind of stupid finale is this? We thought it'd be really cool. That's pretty low-hanging fruit, but I'm also referring to things like how any movie about making movies will win an Oscar, or how Poor Things tried to look like an old black and white European art film to hide the fact that nobody on the writing team had ever met a woman, and then also won an Oscar. Or just the prevalence of nostalgia bait that banks on you fondly remembering a previous experience rather than creating a new one. It's almost like everyone is using their movies as a platform to go, hey look mom, I made a movie and then they forget to put anything in the movie. It's kind of an abstract concept that I have definitely thought about way too much, and I have trouble describing it concisely, but I've recently realized that it leaves a much clearer shadow in the form of what I'm calling completely brain-dead characters. I'm hoping that by looking at some of these examples, the problem becomes more obvious. Doctor Who was a majorly formative series for me, and it remains one of my favorites to this day. I could probably make a bunch of videos about it, and that's a, there's a good chance I will, because I'm planning to do this a lot. I thought I'd be watching it forever, but it's been through some rocky transitions in recent history. Sometime after its 50th anniversary, the show was taken over by Chris Chibnall, previously known for writing the okayest of Doctor Who episodes, and also Broadchurch, one of the tightest crime dramas I've ever seen. So, there's gonna be a real coin flip. Unfortunately, the coin landed on the bad side. Comment down below, which side of a coin is the bad side? My 13th Doctor opinions won't fit into this video, but I linked to a different video in the description by another YouTuber named Verily Bitchy that covers it way better than I ever could. Thankfully, the Chibnall era of this show ended last year with the announcement that Russell T. Davies, the original showrunner from 2005, and in my opinion, the best, was coming back. This man could handle the intricacies of deconstructing society with a grace no corporation has ever dreamed of, and he did it during a time when Tosh.0 was still on the air. Finally, we'd get something new and modern added to this ancient, ever-changing story. David Tennant again. Needless to say, I was hyped, and I didn't think to ask what had been exchanged for this monkey paw wish, and last Christmas I settled in and pulled up the new Doctor Who specials on Disney Plus? Again? Disney, again? It's not even an American property! I thought it was safe over there! Anyway, it's still bad, and I'm devastated, but it's bad in a very different kind of way. A Disney kind of way. To be explicitly clear, uh, isn't because the Doctor is black or because there are trans people in it. Those things are good, in case you're new and have the wrong idea about where you are. It's because of this. Whoa. 
Also this. Space babies. Space babies. Space babies. Space babies. Space babies. Less the babies behind. Space babies. 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 What? was supposed to be the joke. He just says the word space babies over and over again. Like he's not sure you heard him and he needs to see you laugh. Almost like he's secretly some old white dude. To clarify, let's compare some of this new season with one of the older ones. This is pretty easy to do because the beginning of that space babies episode bizarrely copies one from 2005, almost beat for beat but worse. In both episodes, the bald doctor and his recently acquired lower class 20th century blonde companion appear in an unknown space station where they look out the big window, sorry, space window, and marvel at the planet below. At some point, he zaps her cell phone with a sonic object and she calls her mom in the distant past and then they run into the other inhabitants of the space station, which are a bunch of political elites from different planets in the first one, and in the second one, it's... <sighs> And that's when it starts to diverge. So let's just look at these two scenes. In her 2005 episode, Rose Tyler asks the doctor to take her to the future and soon discovers that she's overlooking the earth on the day the sun expands and consumes it. Heavy stuff. The doctor casually insults humans on how hung up they are on little things that don't matter. And Rose's contribution is, Welcome to the end of the world. I mean, yeah, that's, that's what I'd say. You know the feeling you get from watching those scale of the universe videos? That's what she's dealing with. We can tell because this reaction is familiar and natural, and we learn about them both through her reaction, specifically that she is rendered speechless by awe-inspiring sights, and that he is not. Then we watch her processing and navigating this very foreign situation throughout the rest of the episode. She asks a ton of questions about what she's seeing. What are they doing on board this spaceship? I thought the continent shifted and things. He's blue. Yeah. It dawns on her that she's traveling with a bit of a wild card. I don't even know who he is. He's a complete stranger. She realizes she's very out of place, not just because there are aliens, but because the aliens all still are somehow in a higher social class than her. And so she befriends another normal working class person later in the episode because she's finally found something comfortable and familiar. Most importantly, she reaches a point of questioning herself, her decisions, and this strange man she ran off to the future with. Who is he? Does he actually care about her well-being at all? Where are you from? What does it matter? Tell me who you are. This is who I am, right here, right now. All right, all that counts is here and now, and this is me. Yeah, and I'm here too, because you brought me here, so just tell me. She doesn't trust him. She barely knows him. All these responses tell us so much about her, the other characters, and her surroundings. Ultimately, she decides, despite having been terrified for her life, that she can't just go back home and wants to keep traveling with the doctor. That's a very specific person. We don't learn everything about the doctor in this episode, and that's actually good, because we're sharing Rose's perspective. And he's this mysterious complicated time traveler and now would be a weird time for her to learn his life story. In both episodes, we are watching these two people interact for essentially the first time after their respective pilots. So it's a great opportunity to show off who they are by showing how they react to the same things in different ways. Also, they already made it once, so now they just gotta do the same thing in the Disney episode, right? Instead, Ruby Sunday, the character who they named that, looks out at a planet she doesn't recognize and goes, wow, humans really stayed alive, huh? then turns to the doctor and says, but wait, you were also sad a minute ago, but happy now. And he takes a scene to explain his entire personal philosophy and why he chooses to not be sad anymore because he gets to see space. How do you keep going? For days like this, to see the next thing. I don't have a purpose or a cause or a mission, but I have freedom. It looks even better through your eyes. That was like, three doctors worth of quotes paraphrased into one monologued character biography. Ruby is such a bizarre human being in this show. She is so detached from everything around her, it's like she's on a carnival ride. In her first episode, she ends up on a flying pirate ship full of baby-eating goblin puppets, and she just kind of has this expression the whole time, and then it turns into a musical, and she joins in. Like she's been waiting for this moment her whole life. Like she never just needs a minute. You know, it's weird. We never get to process anything that happens because she never has to. It makes sense that the Time Lord isn't phased, like this is a vacation for him, but she should not be able to handle this. It's that contrast that keeps us grounded in reality no matter how many goblin puppets are on screen and tells us what is unique about each of these people. Without it, we'll just brush right past completely absurd behavior because we don't know what's supposed to be normal. Like in Space Babies, when Ruby realizes her mother must be long dead. Right, and my mom, she's long gone now. Rose has a whole existential crisis about her own cosmic insignificance in an identical moment. Five billion years later, my mom's dead. 
bundle of laughs you are. But Ruby is just like, oh, and let's do that cell phone thing so we have it for later, yeah? Now this is obviously just Disney rebooting a very popular series for money, trying to fast track the character development so no one is taken off guard or, God forbid, doubt someone's intentions. But there are plenty of non-Disney examples of this. Video game adaptations are appearing rapidly now that we've finally opened those floodgates, and any big studio can just pick up a pre-built franchise, drop in some half-assed two-dimensional archetypes, and trust the audience will be too absorbed in the familiar sensory information to notice that nothing is happening. What was the plot of the Mario movie? I don't remember, but Bowser sang a song. And he's Jack Black now. The Borderlands movie looks like some amateur cosplay and flash cartoon writing crammed inside the corpse of a Mad Max sequel, but who cares? It has Claptrap. And he's Jack Black now. Even when all they have to do is remake the exact same thing that already worked once, it's somehow like the producer will go out of his way to ruin Tess's entire character, Neil! The Last of Us is a sore spot for me and also warrants its own video, but in short, Tess is a character at the beginning of the game who you follow around, because within this world, she is the main character. She is the danger. She is the hardened smuggler who everyone fears. You, as Joel, are also there. It's kind of what makes it interesting that you're the one who survives. You have your own story, but you're not important. In the show, they change that, taking away the reputation of an objectively badass female character and handing it to the same guy they're simultaneously trying to soften up because he's a little too murdery for television. It's a nonsense decision, and it ends with Tess dying not by fighting to her last breath through a hail of gunfire like any good action hero, but by being sexually assaulted by a zombie before blowing herself up. <laughs> That wasn't in the game, Neil. Neil, come here. Come here. Do you actually not get the story of The Last of Us at all, Neil? Do you not get it because you actually did very little for its success and took all the credit for it anyway? Neil? Neil, did you once suggest to the game writers that only women should turn into zombies and then get that idea shot down because it was so weird and bad? Classic Neil. A game adaptation that people did seem to enjoy is the new Fallout series on Amazon Prime. Uh, and I'd like to apologize to all of those people in advance. I watched some of it. I didn't like it. I have some things to say. I don't actually like telling people they shouldn't like the things they like, especially when I'm not that invested. So if you're a Fallout fan and you liked the show, that's awesome. You honestly deserve it. Maybe skip the next part. <laughs> I was certainly prepared to enjoy it. Being passively familiar with the franchise myself, I think I went into it on pretty neutral ground. But within the first episode, I was already struggling to see any of these characters as people. And I think it's because it suffers from the exact same problem as the new Doctor Who episodes. In the show, Lucy is a vault dweller. A person born underground in an isolated, self-sufficient remnant of idealized 1950s America. There are a lot of implications built into that premise. She's never been outside. She's never seen another group of people or been exposed to a different way of life or to large-scale violence or oppression or to nuclear radiation. She has been exposed to copious amounts of patriotism and propaganda. Like any good cult, it's both wholesome and incestuous. Right off the bat, we expect a main character who's going to be soft, naive, cheerful, an overzealous team player. We make assumptions based on context. This is generally functional and intentional. As a writer, you make these background choices for the purpose of setting those expectations. You can then whittle it down from there per character. After all, there's a whole community of these people, so what makes our main character special? It could be they have unusual talents, like the Avatar. It could be a unique mindset, a longing to break away from her safe but limited home life, like Moana. Or just luck of the draw, like how Luke Skywalker's family is murdered and he's related to the bad guy, so the decision is kind of made for him. You could even subvert the expectations, relying on your audience to make assumptions and then using that baseline to show how off base your character is. Like my favorite character introduction of all time, in Pirates of the Caribbean, bear with me, Captain Jack Sparrow assertively sails a mostly submerged ship into port, casually steps off it like he's just parked his bike, pays the annoyed toll collector three times the fee he's asked for, then robs him as he saunters away without a second thought. We learn his place in this world within like a minute. So why does that work? Sure, his actions and the visual of the sinking ship are all very powerful, but if you've been paying attention, it probably won't surprise you that what I think sells the scene are these people and this guy. It's the reactions he's getting by doing this. When you're watching the scene play out, you see the incredulous faces of the crowd first. You register that other people are shocked by something off screen and your heart starts racing as you think, what's happening? What is he doing? And then you see the ship and it's revealed slowly in this tilt shot where it's at first just him and then you realize the ship is underwater and that's why the scene sticks in your head so much because you were primed for it. If he coasted in without a single glance and this guy had said, hey buddy, 
Maybe next time use our valet service. It would have set a very different tone for the entire movie you were about to watch, despite Jack doing the same thing. But the reactions of other people confirm what we just saw is, in this world, bizarre and unconventional. In Fallout, we are introduced to the Vault Dwellers and Lucy simultaneously, and she honestly doesn't stand out much. Using our checklist from before, she does seem to have unusual talents, in that it's unusual to make your character so talented at everything with no room for any growth. Not that it would make her special, though, right? Because everyone else in her vault presumably has had the same skills, because they had the same amount of time and resources to learn all those things. She has no particular longing to see the outside world or to leave home. She's actually kind of content following the rules and living what she sees as a normal life. We do start on a significant event for her. It's her wedding day and a weird arranged let's not keep the bloodlines too pure sort of deal with another vault. And that almost gives us something because she does ask to do that. But it's like the only aspiration we get from her, to be a breeder and keep America strong, which is weird. We also know she's not the first one to do this. She really just is one of the crowd and does very little to stand out aside from being the daughter of the vault overseer and the only one who is TV hot, which is not a personality. Now this isn't inherently bad. Some of my favorite stories are ones where a wholly unremarkable person is just dealt a bad hand, and we have to see them build new neurons as they figure out how they want to handle it. Bonus points if they already have some anti-heroic personality deficits, which she does not, obviously. She's too quirky and cool, and that side character shit. I'm too chicken. Thanks. Man, can you imagine him as a main character? I can. It would be great. But fine, we're blank slating. This is workable. The important thing is that we need a good, inciting incident to completely ruin her life. Nice! That looks like a character-defining moment. How could it not define your character so hard? If that happened to you and you had to make some kind of terrible choice and live with the consequences, you'd be so defined. Speaking of that, let's take another break from Fallout to talk about trolley problems. You're on a trolley car, heading on a collision course towards someone you love tied to the tracks, and you have the opportunity to move it to another track where it will hit five people you don't know. What do you do? You move it to save your mom? Do you leave it because one life isn't worth five? Depends entirely on the person. An optimistic main character who has never experienced defeat may try to do something ridiculous like, I'll just stick it halfway so it jumps the tracks and doesn't hit anybody, and that doesn't work, and they panic, make some decision at the last moment without even thinking, and then they have to live with that forever, I would assume. It's a thought experiment. And that's interesting and specific to that character. It's one possible reaction and it tells us who that person is. The Last of Us, incidentally, is just a trolley problem. It's the story of how a guy gets to the point of deciding without hesitation, yeah, I'll kill those people, and the consequences of that decision. That's what it's about. Neil. So now's the time. They're attacked by raiders from the outside. There's a big struggle, even though they've clearly already done this to the neighboring vault with no issue. Lucy gets stabbed, her dad gets grabbed, the others are all tied up or something, and we do get a trolley problem. It's just given to her dad, which is fine. We can work with that. The attackers literally give him a choice between saving his daughter or the rest of the entire colony, and he chooses his daughter. I was immediately hooked by what I thought thought was about to follow. He throws her into a safe room just in time to get dragged out and the rest of the vault to be bombed, killing everyone they've both ever known in one fell swoop. She got no say in the matter. She might have chosen something else if she had been offered instead. Also, she's severely injured. So now we're gonna get this story of a lone survivor barely hanging on after literally everything was taken from her, with her only goal being to find the one person in her life who is still possibly alive while also being furious with him for his part in all of this happening to her. An anger which would only grow the more hardship she goes through. It's such a fascinating conflict. Oh wait, they're all fine. And she's she's all healed up. She put staples on it, so. And she's not mad. She, um, she's just gonna, she's just gonna go get her dad. Like, why undo all that? She's leaving! They're not even preserving these characters or this location for later. They're out of the story. Why not give us all that extra motivation of them being gone? The rest of what I saw felt like watching an unsympathetic idiot stroll past giant set pieces while absorbing nothing from this brand new world and feeling no emotion other than vacant optimism. And don't even get me started on this psycho. The ghoul seems potentially interesting, but I only watched two episodes and I don't know if he delivers later. His one action scene was dumb.
I didn't like the show. Even after Lucy leaves the vault, it should have been pretty straightforward to contrast her whole vibe with the gritty post-apocalyptic fallout world, but we never get that familiar measuring stick to compare her against that we so desperately need, which means we never get a personality either. We don't see her acting surprised or scared when she encounters a person she's never seen after only being around the same 18 people for her entire life. She never struggles to focus her eyes more than 20 yards away for the first time in her life. She never deals with changing climates in an outfit that wasn't built for this environment. Crowds of people behaving, speaking, and smelling completely differently than her. You may say, but she's supposed to be that way. And I have no problem making a weird shell of a person your main character but it has to have some effect on their experience. It may seem ridiculous to demand that a story focus on such trivial details instead of the larger plot, but I think if it's something the character would be dealing with, wondering about, trying to come to grips with themselves, then that is the story. The generation of filmmakers I grew up with was encouraged to prioritize plot as story, but plot is not the most important part in my experience. You may hear someone who thinks they have new opinions say something like, uh, yeah, the best stories are about characters but that's obvious and tells you nothing about what to do. I think what writers and filmmakers at every part of the process should be prioritizing is the experience of the characters, and by extension, the audience. Movies have the unique ability to mimic a real experience, even when we know it's happening to another person on a screen, and the story is found through the experience of the character we are watching. It isn't just a checklist of events to hit on cue. In the first Iron Man movie, there is a plot, there are interconnected motivations and backstory on Tony Stark and his father, and social commentary and a Samuel Jackson cameo that nobody understood the gravity of at the time, and none of that mattered next to the fact that we all wanted that suit so bad. The actual meat of this film is Tony and his surroundings adapting to the mere existence of this thing he built. We spend the entire film figuring this out down to the mechanical details of how it works, Pepper's reaction, the army's reaction, villains are just the guys who also want the suit. The whole story unfolds from watching this main character have this experience that no matter what he does, other people want to use his accomplishments to harm each other, and he has the responsibility to keep them from doing that. And all because we get to see him build this armor. In a cave! And it's all done so well. You can feel it. You could hammer that metal. You could solder that arc reactor. You could tell Jarvis to paint it red and gold. We actually all just wanted Jarvis, I think, more than the suit. Anime tends to do this really well. Most of the great shows that I've watched tend to start off by introducing some weird premise and then spend all of their time exploring every single implication of that one change to the world and the effect it has on individual characters. My Hero Academia is only an exploration of the mechanics and ramifications of superpowers with like three actual fights. As the Marvel Universe continues and becomes more and more of a product, this technique disappears. Things just get added for convenience and never addressed. Tony himself goes from die-cut flying metal pants to nanotech on par with alien empires in the span of a decade and nobody goes, whoa, man. How'd you do that? Or at least there's no like cool invention montage of him developing it, you know, because that stops being the point of the movies, which to some extent I get, and maybe that's just the natural consequence of trying to tie like 10 franchises into one chronological story. And I'd say scene to scene, late stage in-game era Marvel did an okay job of grounding us just through in-universe observational humor. Dude, you're embarrassing me in front of the wizards. But at some point, it just broke down. They completely forget establishing factors of this world for the sake of whatever new point they're trying to make. Like when She-Hulk tells Bruce Banner that his advice on controlling anger isn't helpful. Here's the thing, Bruce, I'm great at controlling my anger mm. because I do it infinitely more than you. Cause you see, she's a woman and so she's always angry. She just has to control it, unlike him who- That's my secret, Cat. I'm always angry. <laughs> has actually dealt with exactly that thing because it turns him into a big green monster and if he doesn't control it, he's abandoned by everyone he loves. And that's literally the most famous line in the series. Like, way to pick the single context in which that point holds absolutely no water. Hell, she could have said that and then he could have been like, uh, funny you mentioned because uh, actually we might have a lot in common there. And then they could have like, I don't know, had a productive and character-centric back and forth about emotion and gender from both sides of the same coin, thereby making the point way better than any girl power speech Disney. And that's why what they're doing with Doctor Who is so upsetting, because the entire history of that show is just decisions being made for production convenience, but then being retconned into making sense in-universe just by having characters comment on it. It's bigger on the inside. 
Is it? I noticed. Back in the 60s, when the show was faced with the challenge of having to replace its lead actor, the title role, just to stay on the air, they chose to do something that ended up giving it life for decades. They didn't just sign on a different guy and tell you to ignore it, like a James Bond or a James Rhodes. They decided to have other characters acknowledge that the Doctor had a new face now. What do you think of my new face, by the way? Could be useful on the planet Delphon, where they communicate with their eyebrows. How do I don't want to look? Different. Good, different, or bad, different? Just... Different. Am I ginger? No, you just sort of brown. They were like, he's an alien, he can just do this and let the writers figure out the consequences of that, and they did. Regeneration is possibly the most fascinating part of the show to me. I could watch entire episodes of the Doctor and his companions just having to come to terms with his or her that one time new physical form. Maybe I'm weird, but I think it's this kind of stuff that breathes life into films. It breaks down the fourth wall in a good way. You're expecting things to unfold in a pattern because it's a movie and then the character goes, why is it a blue box on the outside? And the Doctor explains there's a disguise feature that got stuck once and he just doesn't want to fix it because he likes it that way. And now you feel like you know him more as a person and not just a puppet. The new episodes haven't been all bad. The second David Tennant special felt right out of the old series. And one of my favorite moments was when the Doctor is just working on something and starts wondering aloud where the TARDIS goes when it disappears, which happens a lot. He wonders if it pops up on some primitive planet where it sits for thousands of years as a civilization forms and collapses around it, only to finally come back to him when he needs it again at the end of his hour-long episode. And it's the kind of dialogue that my writing class told me specifically not to do. Because when I was in film school, there was always this idea of story economy and how nothing should be in there that doesn't serve the larger narrative or else it just bloats the script. I'm gonna drink some out of this giant water bottle. But if we look Look at it through the lens of experience first. This scene with the Doctor talking about something mostly unrelated to the episode grounds us in the reality of what we're watching. It makes it all feel so much bigger and heavier than just actors on a stage, like there are things going on that we're not seeing. And it actually does tell us things about the character and world and fits into the plot and doesn't interrupt the flow of the episode at all. In fact, he needs to get lost in thought because that's how he doesn't notice that Donna isn't Donna. And the build-up is what introduces these creepy villains who hit way harder because we're distracted and invested. I guess I was just really hoping to see more of that instead of a goblin musical, which still could have been fine. We had something very similar all the way back one episode ago. Neil Patrick Harris shows up in a top secret military base, does a dance number, turns people into balloons, and it is deeply terrifying. The highly trained soldiers and military operatives feel helpless against this trickster god, and the fact that he's being all silly about it makes it worse. This is literally just how human brains work. When we're infants and something unexpected happens, like everything because we're two, we look at our parents and we see how they respond, and then we base our responses around that and our own feelings. In this scene, we see David Tennant, Donna, and Kate Stewart, three very hard to disturb individuals, look scared as hell. And we go, oh, oh, this is not silly. And the contrast of the silliness with the fear in the room makes it all feel disturbing and creepy and it's so cool. There's also a great song and the choreography is fun. Maybe there are more good episodes later in the series too. Again, I only watched a couple and gave up because I'm tired, but man, I'd really just love to see people have fun making movies again. You know, instead of just trying to trick me into watching them, you already had Russell T. Davies and David Tennant. I was gonna watch. Just let the artists do their thing. Anyway. That's it. The teleprompter ended. I'm struggling financially. Thank you for watching my, uh, my rant. I'm still figuring out the format of these long form videos, but they are really fun. Uh, to write and to just make all the way through. So uh, I'm going to be doing a lot more of them, like like wait, like at least one a week. If you're into it, head on over to patreon.com slash doormonster. We got cool stuff there. There's weekly podcasts with me and Allison and Matt. Uh, we have merch. You sign up on the $7 tier, you get a new sticker like every three months. And on the $20 tier, you get an exclusive uh, custom designed door monster t-shirts. You can also buy stuff on Patreon, like the guards themselves as the, the full movie is just there to download for five bucks. And also uh, technically not tyranny, that one song that I made and I'll be uploading more digital stuff as well. And you get all that for free if, you are, if you're just a, a subscriber. There's also digital downloads of all of the videos. If you donate high enough, you get your name at the end. It's a, it's a whole suite of things. And also you get access to a, a special discord room where I will usually go just ramble about whatever I'm doing at two in the morning while I'm still awake working on stuff. And we are still doing the sleep stream. I'm still doing the sleep stream. I'm trying to hit 4,000 a month. And, and if I do, I'm gonna live stream myself sleeping so that there's evidence that it has happened. Anyway, I have this Raid Shadow Legends email up on my computer right now. 
uh, and I'm, I'd really like to not respond to it. So if you can donate, it will. If I have any reason to ignore this email, I'll do it. So please, please, please go to Patreon if you, if you, if you want. If you want, please go to Patreon. Think about it. Do you want to? No. Okay. Bye.